Thank you very much for joining us. We have a couple things to do today. Welcome anybody who is here with students, especially a warm welcome to students, although we know that actually we've been hearing about cancellations that have been happening for school because of the storm that's coming in. So maybe you are watching from home <laughs> instead of with your classroom today. My name is Jennifer Bourgeau and I'm the United States Country Coordinator for the GLOBE program. And this is Mission Snow Globe, an informational webinar for students and educators. Again, we're gonna be posting this online after the meeting and your students can watch it from uh, any time after it's posted. Our webinar agenda today is an overview of Mission Snow Globe and what happens when educators sign up. We're gonna just briefly talk about that. We covered that in detail last week, a little bit more. That webinar is posted already. So I will make sure you have the link for that. The other thing we'll be hearing from the IMPACTS um, principal investigator, Dr. Lynn McMurdy, and she's at the University of Washington and she's gonna tell us about the science behind the project. And then we will be speaking uh, we will hear from Dr. Brenna Biggs about opportunities to speak with the pilots and scientists who fly through the storms. So that's a really exciting opportunity for GLOBE students. And then we're just going to end by, again, reminding you how to participate and where to find more information. And then we'll have some time for questions at that time. So if we go to what is Mission Snow Globe? This is a partnership with NASA investigation of microphysics and precipitation for Atlantic coast threatening storms. And students will be collecting measurements during snow events in January and February and uploading their data to the GLOBE website. The December 15th webinar is posted and we will put that link in the chat as well. So we will make sure you have the links to all of these different hyperlinks um, over in the chat. So check that out. Uh, the next thing is what happens when I sign up. So for many of you, you've already signed up through our Google form. We have a place for you to put in what grade level you're working with and your email. So please do that uh, so we can make sure we have that on file. For a snow event, you'll receive an alert through email, the email that you put into that Google form. Uh, you also have an opportunity to join our Remind classroom. That is totally optional, but that is another way for you to get an alert. The alert will come out 48 hours prior to the storm. If there are changes to the flight plan, and you may receive a second alert. So in order to join Remind, some schools already have this and use this. We have a sign up. There is a link there, or you can text Mission Snow to 81010. And just to assure you, we will not be sending anything after the impact season. So we will only be using this particular email list and uh, the Remind classroom, for want of a better term, uh, during the impact season. We will let you know at the close of the season if there's other opportunities for you to join other lists or to get on our list serves and things like that to continue on. But we really wanna make sure that you know this is only a short-term one. We're not gonna be spamming you forever <laughs> after this. Um, and then during the snow event, you and your students will collect snow data and upload it to the GLOBE website. Okay, so that is where I'm gonna stop. And at that point, I am going to turn it over, oh, yes, to Dr. Lynn McMurdy, if I could. And I see we have some students here, so give a big wave to the students we have. <laughs> and Dr. Great. McMurdy. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So let me fiddle around here trying to figure out how to uh, share my screen. Um, hang on, I will. First, share screen, desktop two. Okay, so then I'm going to put it into um, 
All right. So can you see the um, the slides here? All good? Okay, great. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to tell you about our uh, NASA program called Investigation of Microphysics and Precipitation Atlantic Coast Threatening Snowstorms, a big mouthful, which is why we call it uh, by its acronym IMPACTS. And we're partnering with GLOBE to measure snow. So I wanna tell you about this project. It's an ongoing project. But first, I want to motivate the science. So as you well know, snowstorms really make the headlines. So these are just clips from two different events. One was last year when we actually made measurements during a nor'easter event along the uh, East Coast uh, in, in last January. And then yesterday, I just thought I'd grab a few headlines as this winter storm that's occurring right now. So uh, they make headlines. They're important events. They have a big impacts on the people who are um, affected by them. And But um, it's not so simple. So here I am showing you a picture from a satellite. So this is a satellite that we use all the time for weather forecasting. Uh, it's called a GO satellite, and it always looks down in the same part of the world all the time. So we have very frequent pictures. And this is a that January storm. So yes, you can see there's clouds that extend from South Carolina up well into Canada, big, huge cloud area. But where is it snowing under those clouds? Uh, you can't tell. Uh, so I, I'm going to let you know. I'll let the students sort of scratch your heads and look at this picture and see if you can guess who was the winner, who got the most snow. Was it upstate New York? They're pretty well known for getting lots of snow. Was it the Boston area? Was it New York? From this picture, it just looks white. So how can you tell? Uh, let's go a little closer. Maybe you can have a better clue. Uh, this is uh, this uh, satellite picture. Uh, you can start seeing details in these clouds. Some seem to be a little thicker than others. Maybe those are where it's snowing a lot. It's hard to tell. So what are we are investigating with impacts is learning this distribution of snowfall underneath all these clouds. Where are they located? What kind of structures are they? So a good way to do this is from radar. So I want you to first look at this animation here. Uh, this is a radar sending a beam, a pulse out. And when it encounters something like a raindrop or a snowflake or, or any kind of what we call hydrometeors, something of water in the air, that energy is scattered back to the radar. Not all of it, notice how it's scattered in all directions, comes back to the radar. And then we measure how much comes back. The more drops or the more snowflakes we have, or the bigger ones, make bigger energy that comes back to the radar. And then we can make maps of that. And that's what you see here on the left. So that's for the same time as this picture uh, for where the radar is. And now you're starting to get a clue <clears throat> about where it might be snowing more, where the brighter colors, the yellows, have more re uh, energy back towards the radar and notice how it's organized in these skinny bands. It's pretty bizarre. When you look at the satellite picture, it's like a big wide blob of clouds. But from radar, you think, no, it's not all that even. There's narrow regions of higher amounts of snow or rain, but in case it's all snow, um, organized in these narrow bands and we call them snow bands. And this is what we're after with our impacts project. We want to understand why is this snow organized in these bands? So now you can take a second guess. How good did you do? Did you think it was upstate New York? Well, they were the losers, or certainly at that time. Uh, New York City? Well, maybe, but it was Boston. Boston is the winner. And this uh, map down here uh, on the uh, lower part of the slide is a 24-hour precipitation totals, I kind of squeezed in this, this scale here. It's hard for you to read, but I can tell you the red was two feet of snow at Plymouth, Massachusetts. So they were the big winners. Long Island got quite a bit, but actually New York City was less, more like eight inches. And here's another close-up of those banded structures. Uh, Plymouth was a winner because they kept getting a band one after another, after another, after another. And it was quite an exciting event, very uh, intense snowfall and uh, pretty, pretty crazy, <laughs> pretty crazy event. 
Um, so what we're after, uh, what we are trying to do is understand why the snow is distributed in this uneven way. So you want to measure snow bands, understand the processes that make them. Uh, the technical words are dy dynamics and thermodynamics. Dynamics means movement. Is the air converging? And when it does that, it makes upward motion. Upward motion makes clouds and precip and dumps snow. Thermodynamics is instability. Is the air trying to turn over like a thunderstorm? Because there's actually little thunderstorms embedded in there. And microphysics, see these little tiny pictures? Those are the actual snow particles in the air and we measure that and you measure the properties of that so we want to measure them and understand them and apply this uh, understanding to help satellites measure snowfall from space better and to make um, predictions of snowfall location so help our numerical models those are our ultimate goals with this project so how do we do that well, we do that by flying aircraft with lots of instrumentation on them um, in the storms themselves. And that's why we're partnering with you guys. So the two aircraft we do is one that flies very high called the ER-2. 20 kilometers is about 67,000 feet. So this is well above the height that the commercial aircraft fly. It's way up there. And these are names of instruments, which are all acronyms. And so don't worry about that. All you need to know is that several of them are radars and the others are called radiometers. These are the same kinds of instruments as we have on a satellite. And so the aircraft up here is acting like a satellite that we can control. We can make it go wherever we want and we can fly back and forth across a storm. Underneath at the same time, in coordination with this one, we have an instrument that's measuring inside the clouds, an airplane that's measuring inside the clouds with lots of instruments. And then on the ground, we have radars, and we also send up balloons to get the vertical profile of the atmosphere. These little things look like little parachutes. Uh, this P-3 aircraft that's flying inside the clouds when we're over water we actually send out the airplane a uh, set of instruments on a, on a parachute and that measures the profile of the atmosphere. So we have quite a bit of information, but the one thing we don't have a lot of is measurements of snowfall on the ground. And that's why we're talking with GLOBE here. So just to show you some cool pictures of the airplanes, this is the ER-2. Um, it looks like a giant albatross at least I think, and it's got this huge long nose because the long nose has an instrumentation in it. It only has a pilot. He sits right there. Uh, this is kind of a 3D model of it. You know, here's a big long nose where we have instruments in there. And these things on the side also contain instruments. So we have the instruments here on the wings, uh, one on the belly. And this is a movie. I, I was just uh, out where the ER2 has its home base in California. And they were, they were putting the instruments on the plane and I got to see them testing it out. So if I just turn on this movie really fast, you can see that it's rotating. I don't know if you can hear it. They're, we're talking in the background. And that's a radar scanning down below. So it's, whoops, if I just stop. There we go. So that's my radar. It's called XRAD and it's sitting right in the nose here. So they were testing it before they put it on the plane. And I can tell you it works, which is very handy that it does that. This other plane, this is called the P3. Now this is like a, a plane that I've ridden in. So, uh, you know, about 20 people can be in here with all the instrumentation. And um, we, it's a, it has props, it's a prop plane. And I can know how easily you can see it, but on the, on the wings out in the edge are where our microphysics instruments are. And these are kind of mock-ups of those instruments. These are the real pictures, but they're not nearly as easy to see as the ones that I, I have here. So um, what, it's kind of interesting. I don't know how easily you can see that this, uh, this has a hole in it. And then as we fly through clouds, cloud particles are um, go inside there and we take pictures of them. Same with this kind of thing. Uh, these other ones are actually laser beams and uh, cloud particles fly across them and we, we can get these kind of shadow pictures. We also measure 
liquid water, ice water, and things like that. That tells us all kinds of things about how these snow bands are working. And I wanted to show you my crew on the ground here. So these are graduate students. Um, uh, this guy is Troy. He's stuck out here in Geneseo, New York, launching a balloon in the middle of the night. You, you can't tell, but he's actually grinning from ear to ear because he thinks this is really fun. Um, you can, and this is the middle of one of our snowstorms last year. Uh, we have a radar that's on a truck. So here he is on the truck. If I turn this on, you can see it rotating, going around and around and around. So he's practicing there. And then this is that storm that hit Plymouth. They put the radar on the edge and the tide came in and almost drowned our radar, but thankfully did not happen. <laughs> we got actually really good data from that, from that event. Um, so here's a map of where we have sampled so far. So um, we've been operating uh, the two past winters, well, actually 2020 and we skipped 21 for them due to COVID and then 2022. And, and then their last year will be this coming season. So it's only a three-year project for making measurements. We focus on the Northeast, but we've gone out to the Midwest and we've gone offshore. So this is kind of our range of, of where we can go. Um, we kind of follow where the storms are. Last year, we went up into Canada several times. So that's just a map of, of what we do. And I thought I'd end just for fun to show you some things that we measure. Uh, you don't have to understand any of these, but they're kind of pretty pictures. So this is a picture from that X-ray that I showed you that was rotating. And this is looking straight down. And these colors are radar reflectivity, like what I showed you before, what's in the horizontal, but this is the vertical structure. And you can see all kinds of things. Those clouds aren't solid white. They've got parts that are higher, parts that are lower, parts that are brighter. It's actually snowing pretty heavily here. And these lines are where the P3 flew back and forth. And these are pictures that we took from the airplane. So these snow crystals are amazing. Uh, details that we have, and they're in funny shapes. They're not all beautiful dendrites like that. They can be plates. This is called a ro uh, bullet rosette of all things. This has got a plate that then grew other things sideways. They're pretty wild. And sometimes even when it, the temperature is minus four or even when the temperature is minus 15, we have water drops. So sometimes water gets way up there and that affects the, the snow crystals too. Um, this was that January case, and this case had a lot of beautiful snowflakes, uh, very pristine looking ones on uh, here over land, but over water, I don't know how easy you can see this, so I kind of did a, um, a zoomed in version. See on the, this side part, there's these dots. Those are called super cool water drops that are stuck to the, to the ice crystal. And that makes them heavier and it's called rhyming and those will fall out more and they're brighter too in the radar reflectivity. So we have lots of cool shapes that of the, of the snow that happens in the sky, but we'd like to see more of what happens on the ground. Uh, more pictures. Um, these are my favorite snow crystals. These We call them TIE fighters uh, from Star Wars, but they really are um, snow. This is a snow crystal that is in the air plates on top of columns. And here's the beautiful dendrite again. Um, so impacts needs you. Uh, if it's a snowy day and you're, you've are you got a way to measure and that's this is what uh, Jennifer can talk about. Um, and this is uh, pictures of one of our groups in Canada did this for us when we flew in Canada. They had this uh, a certain kind of a snowboard when snow fell down on it and it stayed cold, they took uh, photographs for us. So this is those shapes of the crystals and the numbers that occurred on the ground compared to what we see from the airplane. So that's an airplane picture. This is from the, in the sky. That's what's happening on the ground. So um, we thank you, the entire team. This is a picture from our science team meeting last summer. And you can tell it's summer, not winter, but I thought you could see what kind of a happy group we are. And um, that's pretty much all I have, Jennifer. And But if you want to have questions, I don't know if you want to do questions on the science now or what you want to do. I think you're muted, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, which is good. I'm glad you did that. Yeah. I would love to have questions now if anybody has any. 
Um, I know we have some students in there, so you can put them in the chat, or if you had, um, if you wanted to unmute. This was I. I love the Tie Fighters. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves the Tie Fighters. <laughs> Let's see if I could open up the chat here. Uh, show chat. So right now there's nothing in the chat except okay. for mine. Uh, oh, oh, there, there we go. Oh, somebody's <laughs> echoing. Uh, Dr. Jabot said, "Do you re did you recently deploy at Fort Drum in upstate New York? So um, Dr. Jabot is out there in Western New York <laughs> getting hit by snow a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we uh, are, uh, I probably forgot to write down the, the time period of uh, operations is January and February. So if you were talking about a storm that happened in November and December, sadly, we were not uh, in, um, in the sky then. Um, we have flown over New upstate New York multiple times. Uh, let's see if I could find my flight tracks. Um, one of our best storms was right here. So I'm not sure what, where, so where, <laughs> I don't know where your town is. If you're near the lakes here, uh, this is one event that we flew back and forth straight across New York state. Um, so upstate New York is actually one of our favorite places to go. Uh, they tend to get good, good events. Uh, we also have some of our colleagues are from uh, SUNY Albany. And I have another colleague who's actually from Illinois, but they have um, deployed things in Buffalo. And so they, we have ground instrumentation in Buffalo. So we, we will fly over there if there's a storm going on at that time. So we haven't flown yet. And we did some test flights in uh, last week and the week before, but mostly right offshore. We were just testing our instruments and, make, and calibrating them. So haven't gotten out there yet, but January 6th is the first day of operations. Awesome. So we had another question. Will we only collect data when notified in advance? So that's a good question, Dave. Um, we would love you to collect data regularly. Um, so the data can be collected every 24 hours. But for this project in particular, um, you'll be notified, you know, the 48 hours in advance of a storm. And then um, we'll make sure that, well, we're hoping that we will have students collecting data for sure at that time. But we always welcome data collected every day uh, that's not, you know, because there's storms that maybe impacts is not flying for, and mm -hmm. but it might be in different areas. So we would love to have data at any time. Um, let's see, at the last meeting, you mentioned having kids take pictures of snowflakes. How would we share those? Um, we are still working on where we are going to store those and how we would have those done. And so we'll have to get back to you on that. Um, we'll have those specifics later. And then we have a question from the classroom. Go ahead, guys. You can ask your question. You're unmuted. You're the leader. How many? You guys can do it. She's the leader. No, I'm not saying that. Go ahead. <laughs> They're all listening to you. I'm not the leader. You got this. Go for it, Dominic. What were we asking? How many snowstorms in January and February? How many snowstorms are there? In yeah, but like where? Here in New York. Uh, so they were they were wondering how many snow snowstorms <laughs> there are normally in January and February. So during this project, like around here, around where so Catskills. Where are you in? In the Catskills in New in York. In the Catskills. Oh wow! I wish I had my. I didn't look at my statistics. I'd say um, we tend to get um, the frequency is if it's an active season. You know, we don't know what kind of season we're going to get. Um, probably every five days or so, we get another event, and you can have some events that kind of linger. You know, you can have the main part of the snowstorm, and then there's kind of like after the snow is through then the kind of showery periods so um i will i can probably look up we do have statistics on that at certain locations like i have it for islip on long island and probably albany i mean like i have to have look at stations that have made recordings for a long period of time to really know how many events are common so like we we would be happy to have a snowstorm every five days <laughs> would be our ideal. And, and a couple of times last year, you know, we 
in the two month period, each of these two seasons, especially last year, we I think we had about 12 storms that we flew in total. But you see that some of them were in the in the in the Midwest and a couple were up in Maine and and Canada. So um, but you could be having snow, but we don't necessarily fly on that. And that's why Jennifer said, to, you know, if you can take daily measurements, that's actually is really helpful for us, too, even if we're not flying. I mean, even if we fly like only here, the whole study you saw in the cloud pictures, a storm can extend a large area. So having an idea of what the whole context is, is very useful for our science, too. Not, and But it's exceptionally useful to know what it's like on the ground from where we fly. If we fly overhead, I think this would be really cool for you guys. So I hope we do. <laughs> Hi, Jen and Lynn. So we have one more question. He's going to try to sure. talk loud so you can hear him. Okay. Um, I'm curious. I don't know how accurate the apps are, but on weather, it says that tomorrow in like the daytime, it's supposed to be very warm, like 40, and then drop to like single digits in the nighttime. I'm just wondering why. Wow, that is called a really strong cold front. It's almost like an Arctic blast. So uh, interestingly, um, I can probably just, in order just to point to things, I can go to back to my storm here. Um, so you, I had an L here, so that's a low center. So the air rotates around in a counterclockwise way, like in the Northern Hemisphere. But it also has these boundaries where the temperature contrasts are really strong. Now, one of them is a cold front. In this case, it's way out here. So in this case, the, uh, the cold front's not important. For But what's coming on, hitting going to hit you guys soon, is you first you have the southerly winds ahead of the cold front, and then the northerly winds behind it. So the southerly winds are bringing all that warm air up from the Gulf of, Gulf of you know, the Gulf Stream. And then behind it is like the blast from Canada. But it's even farther than Canada. I think this this cold air, actually, I'm in Seattle right now. I got two inches of snow outside, which is very unusual for Seattle. You guys think it rains here all the time. We got, we got snow. And, and this same storm has made it all the way across the country and it's changed into this really massive thing and is really bringing a lot of cold air down. So that change is uh, right at the cold front, the boundary between that warm air from the tropics and the really cold air from the poles. <laughs> You're getting the, the tropical air and the Arctic air just right next to each other. And that's why it changed so fast. All Mark. right. Oh, is there more questions? I had, there's some in the chat too, but is there somebody that wants to speak and ask a question? Okay, in the chat, is there similar research being done in the Great Lakes region to study lake effect snow events? Yes, there has been quite a bit. And uh, my colleagues who have installed uh, instrumentation in, um, in Buffalo, I don't know how this changed here. So uh, they have some instrumentation in Buffalo uh, on the ground, so ground-based, not aircraft, and they are studying lake effect snow there. Um, and then uh, that same colleague, she has uh, instrumentation at Marquette, in, uh, which is right on um, uh, Lake Superior, I think, in uh, Michigan. So yes, there is quite a bit of interest in lake effect snow. Uh, we've had past field campaigns that studied that. Uh, they're not ongoing, but they're still analyzing the data from it. So um, lake effect snow is not exactly our goal in our particular event because uh, it's hard to fly aircraft in it because the sh clouds tend to be very shallow and we can't get too close to the ground or it's dangerous for the plane to fly that low. They won't let us, the, uh, the air traffic control won't let us do that. So, um, but yes, there's a group in, uh, who are studying stuff out of Buffalo and a group out of uh, Marquette. Awesome. Um, all right. And there's more questions. Does the data have to be collected at solar noon like other GLOBE protocols? We'd like to apply this protocol to our field trips, camps, which can be done at different times of the day. And I'm really curious about this from you. So we have our standard protocol, um, mm -hmm. but we're also, you know, we want to support this particular, these flights. So what would be hmm. if we were to add more measurements? Um, are there things that you would like the students to think about and, and you know, if they could do yeah. additional measurements 
Um, so be. typically we ask for 24 hours between measurements. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you could let us know if there's other ones that you would like in addition to our standard. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, it's very handy when you do measurements of snow to always kind of do it on an even uh, t time interval. So we have an idea about rate, like how much did the snow, what's the snowfall rate? Um, but, um, and I know you have other, you know, things like you, if it's the middle of a class that you can go out there at certain times. Um, I, one thing I think I didn't say is our flight times are typically around four to six hours when we are actually doing our measurements and a, a total of eight hour flight time. So uh, if you're doing it once every 24 hours, maybe like, you know, every 12 or every six or during the daytime, every six, some other shorter interval of time. And I think it'd be handy if as long as it's the same amount, um, the best you can do. Uh, so a, as long as you write down the time that you took it, I think that's the important thing. We need to know exactly what time you took it and where. And then, then we can um, make uh, um, be know better about how fast it's snowing or how much per hour. If you if you're if there's like a two or three hour window, if you want to do it more frequently, you can do it every hour while we're flying. If it's during the day, but we fly any time of day or night. We might be flying while you're sleeping, <laughs> so you don't have to get up in the middle of the night to make measurements. Uh, only if you're really inspired, but I'm sure your parents won't like that. <laughs> but you know, um, if more frequent would be great as long as you try to make it sort of even, like every six hours or maybe every three, and during the daytime while you know at the times that you can do that, It'd be good. All right, excellent. Um, then we have uh, somebody who's gonna put the pictures of the snowflakes in a Padlet, and then she can share the Padlet. So I'm not sure if you've seen a Padlet before, Dr. McMurdy, but no. we, that is an excellent idea. I love that idea, Janine. So I will follow up with you to ask you more questions about that, because uh, that sounds like fun. I love Padlets. I'm a big fan of Padlet. Okay, um, <laughs> all right. Um, so should I stop sharing the screen here or um there are let's see uh we have using globe observer is it best to just use precipitation or one of the bundles okay so we can cover that one Dave after um is there any more about uh let's see a good resource to improve snowflake pictures with iPhones uh so did mm -hmm. you want to make a comment about the macro photos there just looks like Janine, you had something to say about that. Uh, yeah, um, I, after our last meeting, um, a kind of, I was worried about the same thing, the kids taking the pictures and, um, the kids at my school aren't allowed to have their phones out. So I was kind of just kind of like trying to, I've been spending this, uh, I'm already on Christmas break. I've been spending the break trying to like plan ahead. How am I going to do this next month? And it snowed a couple days ago. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to go out and try it and see how, how well they turn out on my phone. And um, number one, I was super shocked at how well the pictures turned out. I couldn't believe that I was able to take really, like, really pretty pictures of snowflakes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we went outside. I had on a light colored sweatshirt and my husband had on a really dark colored sweatshirt. And the pictures that we took of the snowflakes that fell on his sleeves turned out way better because he had this dark colored sweatshirt on. And then um, I just thought, I've got this cool phone with like five camera lenses on the back of it that I have no idea like how to actually like to its full potential use it. So I thought, I wonder if you can select the lens on the back of your phone, like if you can go in and manually select it, it use the macro lens. So I was kind of Googling it and looking to see if there's a way to, and I thought, you know, I probably could figure this out, but I don't even think it's going to matter because the kids, so basically we're going to have to probably just use my cell phone outside when the kids go out. Um, but in stumbling through Google stuff, I came across this YouTube um, video of some guy who had taken a part in the YouTube video, I could share the link if um, if you could give me a second to find it. Um, the, he took apart a cat laser toy and took out the lens 
and he stuck it on a hair bobby pin and then taped that to the back of a cell phone and used it to make this like macro lens. And I was like, yo, my kids would love to do something like that. They just love to tinker with stuff. And so I thought, well, I better try it first to see if it works. So I went to the store and bought a cat laser, brought it home, tried it out, and it it legit worked. It actually like works kind of like a kind of like a low grade microscope. Um, and then the other thing that um, after that worked, I have um, these microscopes at my school that are called fold scopes. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them. But um, I actually took one of the lenses out of the fold scope and attached it to the back of my phone. And that lens also worked. So if you have some kind of a small lens like that, and I know you can buy the little um, microscope lenses like on Amazon. So I'm sure there's a couple different things that you could play around to do with the snowflakes pictures, but, um, but they definitely worked without when I went outside with my cell phone. The problem that I personally was running into is once you zoom in to take a macro picture, your phone becomes really unsteady. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to hold it still enough. And so I think what I'm going to do is have my phone set up on like a gorilla pod outside when we go do it. And then I'm just going to have the kids come up to the phone instead of someone holding the phone and chasing people around trying to so I'm just gonna have like a spot where the kids need to stand in front of to take the pictures. So that's my plan. And then the Padlet is um, if anyone ha has any questions about Padlet, I think Padlet is like the best resource to use for kids to collaborate photos and stuff. And the kids love using it. So um, I don't know if there's another thing that we could use to collaborate because I just thought it would be really cool if we could see others photos of the snowflakes. Yes. Right. So um, what we'll do is let's we'll compile that into an FAQ, all of those things. And if you could send me those links to the YouTube, okay. that would be great, because I think what you just shared is really um, useful information for other teachers and educators and students. So okay. um, let's I will come back and contact you so we can put those all together. OK, so, perfect. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Um, okay, so now, um, you know, I was, I'm going to turn it right over to Dr. Biggs, and she is going to talk to us about um, some opportunities that we have as students and educators to talk to people doing the flights. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. My name is Dr. Brenna Biggs. I am the communications lead for NASA Airborne Science. And I want to talk today about a tool called Mission Tool Suite that we use on airplanes. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, which will have some slides about this. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the opportunities we have upcoming to use this. I'm gonna go ahead and share. Okay, sorry, I think I was muted, I'm back. Um, can someone confirm that they are able to see this screen? All set. Great, awesome, thank you. Okay, so I wanna just start by introducing this idea. Um, Dr. McMurdy showed some really nice flight tracks of where IMPAX has flown. And IMPAX is one of, a, one of many airborne science missions that NASA flies. And so this just so shows flight tracks all around the world that are different airplanes go to. And these flight tracks are an opportunity, these flights are an opportunity to not only discover more about our planet, but to also connect students and educators and the public with the researchers, the people on the airplanes who are making these discoveries. Scientists use this tool called Mission Tool Suite, where we pull together all of the flight resources in one place and allow accessibility for folks who are flying on the airplane and folks who are on the ground. So this is a space where we can plan, communicate, and have situational awareness for all NASA airborne missions. We are able to see where the airplanes are in real time, as well as where our satellites are in real time. And it provides a space for 
folks who are on the ground, who are supporting the mission from the ground, can chat with folks who are flying on the airplane. This tool suite can be adapted for the unique needs of missions. So what it looks like for impacts might look different for a different mission. This is kind of an example of what this looks like in real time. So we're able to see the platform statuses and payload telemetry. So this is where the plane is, how fast it's going, what the altitude is, the date and the time. We're also able to look at satellites and predict where they're going to be at a certain time so that we're able to fly under them if we want to. We're able to see flight tracks of the airplane. We're able to see payload status and data visualization. And then some other things I'm going to talk more about too are a chat function, which is really important. We can also share documents and models using this mission tool suite or MTS. So what we've done is we've taken this idea of MTS and we've made it a little bit easier for teachers and students to use, um, showing things that they might be interested in looking at. So we call this MTSO or MTS Outreach. And this is a scaled down version of MTS with similar features and it's used specifically for K through 12 outreach. So we still have things like the live flight tracking, we're able to watch the planes and where they are in real time. Oftentimes we have camera feeds directly from the plane. We have real time satellite products and data visualization. Um, we have live text chats between classrooms and the folks who are on the airplane. And one thing I really want to highlight here, this is web based. It does not require a specific app or a separate download in order to use and it's free, which is also awesome. If we take a look at the image on the right, this shows the view of MTSO during Hurricane Nadine several years ago. So students were able to track the evolution of the hurricane in real time and they were able to see a photograph photographs coming in from the plane of the hurricane, as well as chat with the scientists who were actually collecting the data about the hurricane. MTSO connects K through 12 students to NASA scientists, pilots and engineers in a relatively low cost and accessible way. One thing I really want to highlight that's been very fun to do in the past is we use text-based chats. Um, we use a client, an IRC client called XChat or HexChat. This is something scientists already use to communicate. So folks who are on the plane can easily communicate with folks who are on the ground using this internet relay chat. We leverage this additional, this existing system by adding an educational chat room, which we call Ask Airborne. So this is a chat room in which um, I can facilitate chats between classrooms and, and students and teachers with folks who are actually doing the science on the airplane. And so this is a way we can connect people on the ground to people on the airplane all through these chats. If we look at the image on the right, we can see the project manager and mission scientists for a project called Icebridge. They were on board one of NASA's airplanes, the DC-8. They were flying over Antarctica and they were live chatting with folks who were in a middle school classroom in the state of Maryland. So it's a really cool way to connect folks who are doing the science. This is an example chat, what the interface looked like during Tracer AQ, which is a very recent NASA airborne mission. We're able to see a chat between a sixth grade classroom in Hawaii and the person in charge of the Tracer AQ mission flying out of Houston, Texas. Students were also able to track the Gulfstream 5 airplane in real time and look at the status like the date, time, altitude, wind speed, etc. during the flight. This is a really cool way to connect students to the researchers. So this is an example of students that were talking to the pilots and the scientists on the P3 airplane. And as they were chatting and watching the plane tracker, they realized, hey, the plane's about to fly right over our school. So they ran outside and they spelled out the word hi with their bodies as the plane flew overhead. So this is a really good way to connect students with the scientists in a really informal and fun environment. I just want to show a few examples of success with this um, with this tool suite during Icebridge, which is a long running campaign that NASA had a few years ago. We connected to almost 500 classrooms in over 100 schools, nine countries and 31 US states with almost 12,000 students reached. So we do do this outreach all around the world. It's not limited specifically to a certain region. Of course, if you're following impacts, that's going to be more of an eastern seaboard type of flight. But if you're somewhere else in the world, we'd still love to connect with you. These are some example questions that students asked uh, during some of these connection opportunities. So I was asked, can a girl who looks like me become a scientist someday too? What is NASA doing to help our planet? What can we do to stop air pollution? How do satellites stay on track? What is the coolest thing you've done in your career so far? And what was the most mysterious thing you've ever studied? So 
the questions can range. We do K through 12 outreach. And so the, the level of the questions might change based on the student asking, but they're always so intelligent and so curious. And I love, this is my favorite part of this, is the, the idea of students being able to be heard by the scientists. We've done many missions using MTSO and connecting students to the scientists. We've been doing this for over a decade during 11 large scale NASA missions to connect scientists to over 28,000 students worldwide. During the pandemic alone, shortly after the impact flights of 2020, we, um, we reached over 3,000 students just during the pandemic because everything was so virtual. This was a great opportunity to connect with people. We've received many positive comments from teachers and educators worldwide. For example, this person from Palmdale, California says, the idea of real scientists taking time to chat made quite an impact on them. They need to know that adults care about their questions and want to help them learn. A tremendous opportunity. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this. This 12th, 10th through 12th grade teacher in Illinois says, I am new to teaching these classes which are designed for students who struggle with science. I continue to be amazed by their curiosity about science. I have found that struggling does not at all mean disinterested. And for them to have a chance to connect with NASA science, well, they were genuinely excited. So in the future, um, I just wanna mention, this is something that's been on my mind. I am the new um, Airborne Science Program GLOBE Engagement Coordinator. And so I'll be working more closely with GLOBE and trying to work more closely with GLOBE schools to try to give them more opportunities to connect with NASA science, starting with impacts this upcoming year. So I'm really excited to be in this new role and to connect with you all in the future. Just in summary, this tool connects K through 12 learners to NASA Airborne Science by leveraging tools that scientists already use, making it a very low barrier to entry for both the teachers and educators, as well as the scientists. It features a chat and a tracker for NASA airplanes and satellites. It's web-based, does not require an app or a download. It lowers the barrier to connecting classrooms with real NASA scientists, pilots, and personnel, and it benefits classrooms and communities hit hard by the pandemic. I want to just leave my contact information up here. Um, I will be working really closely with Mission Snow Globe coming in the coming months. Um, I can also set up individual chats between your classroom and the program. Um, so if you are curious about this or if you're curious about any future missions, please, please, please take down my contact information. Uh, Jen will have it as well. If you're interested in looking at our airplane tracker or the models or missions that we have about airborne science, you can check out our website here. With that, I would love to take any questions and thank you so much for your time. All right, are there uh, any questions? While we're waiting for folks to type in the, in the chat, I can share a little bit about what this, this could look like in the future. Um, so for the upcoming campaign, it's, it's, after talking to Jen yesterday, it sounds like I will be primarily communicating through the Remind um, program. And so I do encourage you to get on that list so that you know when there's going to be upcoming opportunities to talk to folks who are flying on the airplane. So that's one of your options is to get on there. And once we know that a storm is coming and once we know when the planes are going to fly, I will set up just a block time and say, hey, if you want to hop on during this time, I will be online to help facilitate chatting. Um, the other option is you're welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, I will put my contact information here in the chat. This is if you want to have more of a one on one, I will give you a presentation to your classroom and then can try to connect you with somebody from the campaign. So you have multiple options here and ways to connect, but um, you'll have access to watching the plane in real time. Um, and we're hoping access to talking to people who are part of the campaign as well. Does anybody have any questions? Brenda, I just want to emphasize that um, since I was participating in 2020 as well, it's really exciting for our scientists to talk with the students. I had such great questions and it happened to be my niece's uh, son's class was involved. So I got to even have a personal connection. So which was really, really a lot of fun. Um, and all of us uh, scientists, especially those who are as quite so busy you may not be able to you can't talk to the pilots who are awfully busy but after the uh, flight or before the flight you know, in between flights you can talk to pilots but uh during a flight um there we're going to always have somebody designated to answer questions to uh that may pop up in the ask airborne science whatever that chat room is called so um don't worry we'll be there and um i just hope we're not flying at 2 a.m all the time <laughs> 
can't guarantee it'll be during class time, but we'll try. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. McMurdy. That's wonderful. Um, it looks like Tiffany's classroom has a question. Go ahead, guys. One more time. There is a lot of feedback. I'm sorry. Sorry, we have to like unjoin the audio on one computer and link it to okay. another. <laughs> yes. Okay, Tom, go ahead. Um, oh, do you have a prediction on the next like snowstorm and when you guys are gonna fly next? I'm gonna let Dr. McMurdy handle that one. <laughs> oh, I wish I knew. So the very first possible uh, flight day would be January 6th. We don't know if there'll be a snowstorm then, that's too far in the future to trust our, our numerical models. But um, we have a daily briefing starting, we can actually start January 4th, that ER2 aircraft, the big one, that the, what, the smaller fly, plane that flies really high, uh, it flies across the country on the 4th. So actually that's the first day you could watch uh, on MTS um, and we'll be watching that plane as it's coming across and um, hoping that, you know, maybe we'll aim it to aim for whatever clouds we can find between Palmdale and, and, and Georgia. It, it's going to be based in Georgia. So the very, very first flight will be when, um, when the year two flies across the country. And then the, after that, starting January 6th, it could be any time. I just don't know when it will be until, until we see what the weather is. I wanted to just add to that. I just put something in the chat. This is a this is our public facing tracker, so you wouldn't even need to communicate with Dr. McMurdy or me to access this. This is just online for everybody to use. Please feel free to check it out. This shows the location of all of the NASA aircraft. So it's really fun. You're able to see where the ER2 is right now. When it flies over to the East Coast on the, I think Dr. McMurdy said the fourth, when it does that, you'll be able to see it in transit over the United States. And once they start their flights, you'll be able to see the airplanes moving around in real time. So this is a really fun, this is just fun to be able to track the airplanes in real time. So that's in there. Um, I just dropped it in the chat. Hi, we were also wondering where are the airplanes landed when they are not in the sky? Where are they being housed? So the, uh, the P3, the one that flies inside the clouds is at Wallops Flight Facility on, on, in Virginia. Uh, I, uh, most of us are staying at Chikatik, uh, which is right on the coast there. Uh, and then <clears throat> the ER2 is going to be at the, at the Dobbins, um, Army Air Reserve, uh, uh, Air, Army Air Reserve Flight Facility or whatever. I don't remember exactly what it's called, which is, uh, like North of Atlanta. We have that one down in, um, uh, Georgia, because it's kind of a, a very particular plane. It can't take strong crosswinds. You saw how wide the wings are. It can be easily flipped if it, you're trying to land it in conditions that are too windy. And I saw a question in the chat about a calendar of shorts. So I'm going to put um, a link to our field catalog and it has a daily science plan on there. So um, I can, uh, uh, to, uh, I'm going to do that on the chat right now. So um, I know uh, Brenna and Jennifer are going to be monitoring this as well, but every time we, after we do our briefing, we post our plans out to day five and sometimes out to day seven. So that gives you at least a heads up of what's coming up. So I will add, oh, thank go you. ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go oh, ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, I will add to that um, for Darian Becker, who posted in the chat regarding what flight projects are available, um, it, like coming out in the future, even after impacts you're welcome to reach out to me. And I have a listserv of folks that I reach out to whenever I'm gonna do outreach for a campaign. So I can add you to that list of people. I also put in the chat an overview calendar of all of NASA's stuff that they have upcoming. You're welcome to look at that at your leisure. I don't do outreach for every single one of those. It usually is a bigger, you know, like impacts is very large. We have a lot of people working on it. There's multiple aircraft. Those large scale campaigns I typically do um, I know for sure I will be doing some outreach for Bioscape. That's something that's happening in South Africa uh, in the fall of next year. So if you're looking for something later in the year next year, that's going to be available too. But please reach out to me. I'll add your email to my list of people so that you stay in the loop. And that'll be one of the things that we follow up with too. Once this mission is over, um, we will be asking you if you want to be uh, stay connected. Um, to all of these things. And so you would opt in to these other opportunities too. 
Um, so we hope that you do that as well. And I'm really excited about the partnership between GLOBE and the Airborne Missions um, that's coming up. Um, there were, I, and I have to also say that as a former science teacher, as a scientist, um, having a background in that, looking at the science plan that Dr. McMurdy just put in there, my heart just kind of get did a little leap because um, we always talk about having science notebooks and tracking and communicating what is happening uh, in your classroom, even if it's or, or, you know, with your science, it's so important. And so I read the science plan and I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is exactly what um, students should be doing if they're doing these projects. And so just having this daily science plan of what we're doing, I think it just captures that whole idea. Um, so we have, oh, our bell is about to ring. <laughs> We are excited to have you um, participate in this. Um, if you can stay on for a few more minutes, I was just gonna go through a couple more slides just to remind everybody of what we're doing. In the chat, there are the ways to sign up for the um, Remind and the Google form. I saw a couple people sign up as we were coming, uh, as, as I was putting those links up, so that's great. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'm hoping uh, that uh, oh, um, that we can have some follow up also with Dr. McMurdy uh, in, in flight, and also if students have questions, would both of you be available for us to follow up with you later on? Sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> now, I'll get grumpy if I get very busy, but <laughs> but. Uh... Uh, if it's not me, as somebody else on my team, I'd be happy to talk with you. I have uh, quite an army of uh, graduate students, postdocs, and other colleagues who will be in the Ops Center all starting in January. We kind of a rotation of, of people coming in and out. I'm sure one of the, if it's not me, some one of them would be happy to talk with any, any classroom and, and do outreach. A lot of people are excited about that. That is great. And we love to hear from graduate students, too. Um, yeah. So that... Uh, and yes, we, might, we, won't, we won't overwhelm you. <laughs> I'm good at delegating. <laughs> you talk to them. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so I know some of you may have to go um, because we might have gone over your class time that you had allowed, uh, but I do want to go back to um, this PowerPoint, just for a couple more slides. Um, so just a reminder of what data we're going to be collecting is snowpack, new snow depth, snow water equivalent, um, and then we have some optional measurements. And we're going to be using the Atmosphere Integrated One Day Data Sheet, or you can use the Globe Observer app. So these are, again, for Globe teachers. To log in, you have to log in with your teacher account. Um, because that is going to get you to the pages where you're going to be able to enter data entry. Um, so that is where the snow measurements won't come up unless you log in with your Globe Educator account. The other way you can do this is you can enter your data through the live data entry on the Globe website. And uh, the reminder, the big reminder is please Again, go back to the uh, webinar that we did last week. It has some more details. You're going to wanna locate and define the study site where you're going to be taking those snow measurements. So those will appear in the data entry as a site where you can enter data. I'll also say that what I have found with this is you need to define the study site and then the app will ask you if you need to update your forms you're going to want to say yes. So come back on to Wi-Fi if you are off it and then accept that you want to update your forms at that point so that the study site will show up. If you don't update the forms, your study site may not show up. So please do that. Um, that's my big FYI. And then we did have a couple um, resources and these are all on our event page, which I had posted in the chat. So we have this current snow depth map from the US Forest Service. 
And then we have some literacy connections. So start getting out your books and reading up on snow. Um, and then we hope to see you taking the data. Um, and we will follow up with, I'm going to be super excited to see your data come in. Um, and so I hope that uh, we can do some follow up with that and summarize some of your data that we see coming in, because that will be exciting. <laughs>